Order, order. The committee is now in session. Uh, the government has said that it would prioritise investment in world-leading science research, uh, including the biggest ever increase in the science budget, £22 billion pounds a year, uh, and to create a new science funding agency modelled on the US Advanced Project Research Agency, or ARPA. Uh, now, the Science and Technology Committee undertook an inquiry into this new funding agency, and we issued a report on the 12th of February. The bill to bring into existence what will be known as ARIA, the Advanced Research and Invention Agency, uh, backed by £800 million of taxpayers' money, was published two weeks ago and is about to begin its scrutiny in both Houses of Parliament. Uh, the Prime Minister's uh, previous Chief Advisor, Dominic Cummings, uh, is, through his writings, widely thought to be the originator uh, of the ARPA model as a proposal uh, for the UK, uh, and indeed is known to be a supporter of the, uh, the commitment to increase the science budget. Uh, now he's no longer working uh, for the government, he's free to speak, and we're very grateful for his attendance today. Uh, I'm also delighted to uh, anticipate the attendance uh, of the Secretary of State for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, the new Secretary of State, uh, and his lead official uh, on science policy in what will be their first appearance before this committee. Now, this is a session on science funding. Uh, the committee has also been inquiring into the COVID pandemic, uh, and there are questions that we would like to ask Mr Cummings uh, about the response to the pandemic. Uh, he's kindly agreed to give evidence on that to the joint inquiry that we're holding with the Health and Social Care Select Committee on lessons learned from the pandemic. And so that will allow us to focus today's session on science funding. Uh, perhaps I can start uh, with a question to, uh, to Mr Cummings. Uh, what is the problem to which ARIA is the solution? Um, so I think the, 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 there's a few uh, overall, uh, overall problems. First of all, almost all science funders globally operate in the same way. They have pretty much the same metrics like papers. They have pretty much the same kind of horrific bureaucracy. They waste huge amounts of time uh, for the researchers in filling out all of these forms, and they get pretty much the same results. Secondly, you have uh, a few examples historically of things that work on completely different principles and are super, super productive. But these sort of entities, whether it's like the Manhattan Project, like the old LMB, uh, like ARPA in the 60s, um, Bletchley, these sort of things, are, um, they tend to be uh, destroyed by bureaucracies pretty quickly over time, and the people who run them tend to, be, tend to be driven away. It's turned out to be extremely hard for normal government systems to learn from the most productive enterprises. You also have a, a situation in which uh, issues around science and technology are increasingly important to government. We've obviously just seen that in 2020 with, with COVID. Uh, um, uh, and you also have this huge wall of money from people like uh, from China and from America coming into it. So you have all of these different pressures on, on, on the system. And you have a white hall which is not being configured to think uh, rationally about how to do science and technology policy. Britain can't solve all these problems by itself, and, and, and an agency can't. So I think, obviously, there's a whole bunch of things that have to change the overall system. What ARIA can do, though, is to, is to look, is to be decisively different from all other funding entities. So I've got a chart done by a brilliant scientist who wrote the textbook on quantum computers, a guy called Michael Nielsen. I hope, hopefully you can see this. I'll put it on my blog if it doesn't show up very well. But here Put it you on have, the committee's website as well. This is basically where all funders globally are. They're in this little bubble here. But this is the actual design space for how you could do science and technology. And the purpose of ARIA ought to be to sample in this broader design space, to do things differently, to learn from the things that have been super productive in the past. And that essentially means, in, I guess in, in very simple terms, it means uh, extreme freedom. That's one of the great lessons of the things that have been most successful historically. That's what produced the, the internet and the personal computing re revolution. You need to, so, you, so you need to strip out all of the horrific Whitehall bureaucracy around procurement, state aid, uh, human resources, civil service pay scales, uh, all of these sorts of things, and, and huge set of processes from the Treasury as well, things like the Treasury business case process which is horrific and causes uh, huge delays in science and technology. There's logic for it elsewhere in the system, but as applied to science and technology, it's very, 
it's very damaging. So I think, in a nutshell, the way I would define the purpose of ARIA is there's no point creating it if it's just going to be another one, another entity in that, in that little red thing. Right? The purpose of it has to be to sample the wider space and to do things very differently. And to do that with extreme freedom and busting the bureaucracy that's already there. Yes. Uh, we'll come and, um, and ask some more detailed questions about uh, each part of that and my colleagues uh, have got some follow-up questions. Um, I think it's, it's evident most people accept that the, the proposal to have a UK ARPA, now ARIA, uh, was yours. Um, was it something that you proposed to the Prime Minister? Was it part of a, a deal that you did with the Prime Minister to, to join him? So uh, I wouldn't say it's my idea. I mean, all, all I'm doing is, is doing is suggest, was suggesting what a lot of the, the best scientists and technology people in the world have been suggesting for decades. Actually, that Britain should learn from some of these examples, including the 60s ARPA. So I wouldn't, in, in any way, this is not my idea. Um, uh, essentially, what happened in, in terms of uh, what you're talking about is the prime minister came to speak to me uh, the Sunday before he became prime minister, and said, "Would I come into Downing Street to try and help um, sort out the?" huge uh, Brexit nightmare. Uh, I said, yes, if, uh, first of all, you're deadly serious about actually getting Brexit done and avoiding a second referendum. Secondly, double the science budget. Third, create uh, some ARPA-like entity. And uh, fourth, um, support me in trying to change how Whitehall works and the Cabinet Office work, because it's a disaster zone. And he said, um, deal. Where, where, where did he say deal? Where were you when that was concluded? Uh, in my living room Sunday before he became Prime Minister. Just you and him, or were there others there? Just him, he, just me and him. Okay. Um, and now that you're not there, are you confident that the government will stick to, to the four elements of that? One, one has clearly been uh, done already. Um, I think that, as, as, so as far as I can see from the budget, the, the plan is to stick to the doubling of, this, uh, uh, of the science budget, um, uh, though there are some issues around that. I think that the fact that they brought in the bill shows that the government remains committed to doing it. I think the problem is, is much less likely to be, does the government decide not to bother trying to do an ARPA? The problem is this, is this deeper problem that it's just, you know, there's a reason why it's on the one hand, you think, OK, you've got this model from the 1960s. It's so incredibly fruitful that a few hundred million dollars generates tens of trillions of dollars in value with the internet and the personal computer revolution and all the other things that were spun off out of pot. Obviously, human civilization will learn from that and try and do the same thing, right? But in fact, it turns out that's, not, not, that's the opposite of, uh, uh, of the truth. In fact, what happens is... ARPA itself, the institution that did that, was itself very much changed in 1975. It became more bureaucratized, it made it much harder to fund the things like the internet. So I think that's the real problem here for, 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 for ARIA. Um, that it's not so much will the government lose the will to do it, it's that the principles according to which these sorts of things are very successful are completely hostile to normal bureaucracies. That's why they don't normally happen. And therefore I think the bigger danger is that it sort of half happens, that they create something but it's basically no different. Uh, and if, you, if, if MPs were going to choose to do that, then it would actually be better, in my opinion, not to bother doing it at all. The okay. only point of doing it is to, is to make it decisively different from what already exists, otherwise you're just adding to the chaos. Okay, we'll, uh, we'll come into some aspects of that. Uh, but isn't there a paradox uh, here about ARPA, ARIA? Um, it was in the Queen's speech in October 2019. We're now in March 2021, nearly a year and a half later. It hasn't even begun its passage through Parliament yet. Yeah. Um, you've just been very critical of the, the bureaucracy um, surrounding administration and science uh, funding. Mm. Yet this institution seems to have the gestation period of an elephant. Um, you were in office for 80% uh, of this time. Um, you were, after the Prime Minister, the most powerful person in Downing Street, and some say the country. Why were you not able to make it happen during that time? So we made some progress in the second half of 2019 on it, uh, but we were inevitably, uh, you know, fundamentally, like everyone else in, in politics, we were uh, uh, swamped by the Brexit uh, um, problem. 
as soon as the election was finished, I started work on this in, in January. Actually, science funding was the main thing that I worked on in January, immediately after the election. But of course, then, um, like everything else in, in, in government, uh, everything was kind of swept away for a few months in the first wave of COVID. But I think the fact, so you're obviously right to, to, to point to the, to, to, to the delays, but I think that show that having, having had many, many dozens and dozens and dozens of meetings on this, um, it's connected to this, to, to the problem I, uh, I mentioned in the, pre, in the previous sentence. Doing something like this is so contrary to how the normal system works that it's very hard in Whitehall to push through something like this. Um, you have, uh, you know, after over a year of discussing it, we suddenly had the Treasury come back in um, September, October time last year and say, hang on a second, hang on, we don't want to have primary legislation at all. My God, if we do this and we start enshrining a legislation that some entities don't have to follow all of our bureaucracy, my God, where will it end? Everyone will suddenly want to have this this wonderful freedom. Maybe we can do this without having a bill. it was in bill. the Queen's speech in October 2019. Why... Why were you debating whether legislation would be needed when it was included in the Queen's speech eight months earlier? Because the Treasury suddenly came back and said, we've come up with our own different legal advice after a year of everyone in Whitehall debating it, and we actually think that we don't need a bill after all, and this is a completely different way of doing it. Uh, so I think the whole episode shows just how hard it is for Whitehall to, 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 to deal with the concept of, um, uh, of, of creating something with low friction. Um, and removing things like the Treasury, the, the, the Treasury business case. Final one from me on this before I turn to, to colleagues. Um, in our report, we said that uh, 800 million pounds uh, for a new science funding institution is obviously very welcome, mm -hmm. as long as that is not taken from raiding very important existing science budgets and yeah. projects. Uh, was part of your your deal with the Prime Minister that this should be additional uh, or? Did you anticipate that this would come out of uh, other research programmes, including medical research that has served us so well during this pandemic? No, it was always uh, very, very explicit and clear throughout my time in government that this would be uh, additional money. We made those commitments to the Royal Society, to all the different funding councils, to everybody else. This, uh, this should all be part of the, the, the... should be funded with new money from the doubling. That was always the original plan. That was the plan throughout my time in government. Um, hopefully that hasn't changed. If it, if it has, then it shouldn't have done. And so you wouldn't expect that the budgets for UKRI, for example, should be falling given this? Certainly not. And so when I left, UK, the UKRI budget was, uh, was penciled in the spending review to get very generous increases over coming years, uh, as it should do. Thank you very much. I'll turn to my colleagues, starting with Graham Street. Uh, morning, Dominic, and th thanks for coming to the... Uh, committee, are you pleased with the detail uh, in the bill that will set up uh, this organisation? Because when I read it, it looked as though uh, the bureaucrats who you say destroy I I initiative and innovation in the science world had got their grubby mitts on it, because at any time, uh, the government can take control of the organisation. If you look at Schedule 1 uh, in, in the bill, there are all sorts of other controls in, in Section uh, 2 of the bill. Are, are you um, pleased with it or disappointed with it? There are too many restrictions. Certainly in my model of it, um, you wouldn't have ministers anywhere near making decisions about how it spends money. I think that would be a disaster. Um, uh, in my model, it would be extremely, it would be extremely simple. You, you would have, uh, you'd find a, a director, you'd have probably maximum four trustees so that they are actually real trustees and they have real control, not one of these normal government things with like 20 people on a board so that no one's actually uh, exercising serious responsibility for it. Um, and you would cut it loose of the, uh, of, uh, of the rest of the system. Um, uh, so no, I'm not confident about, uh, about uh, how, how it will work out. Um, there's certainly very strong, so th 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 there's a mix as you would expect. On the one hand, there's a lot of people who know the history of things like ARPA and Bell Labs um, and the old LMB and whatnot, who know the value of this kind of model. 
and say, obviously, Britain should do this. And there are a lot of brilliant officials who think it's a wonderful idea and they've worked extremely hard to do it. But it's also crucial to remember that the basic principle of extreme freedom is completely hostile, is completely the opposite of how um, all normal science funding works uh, and how all normal Whitehall works. Um, so I think UMPs have to be, have to be um, a, 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 a extremely vigilant. Um, in, in particular, I think, vigilant about... Um, look, the, the, I think the, the, there's a tendency to think of the science, uh, science funding system like there's people running the system, but that's not the reality. The reality is the system runs the people. Uh, there's huge veto points everywhere. So everyone can block things, everyone can stop good things happening, but almost nobody can actually get anything done. Um, and this, uh, and, and, and this chain of bureaucracy runs all the way down from the, the people at the bottom of the hierarchy in things like EPSRC making decisions about pure maths, through the hierarchy of EPSRC, through UKRI, through Bayes, and then up to the Treasury. So you have these chains of business cases and emails running up and down and up and down this hierarchy for month after month after month, driving everybody completely insane. Um, but if you say, well, let's just completely get rid of that, it, 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 it makes no sense. Then, um, it, uh, you know, some parts of the system say brilliant and other parts of the system say, oh, my God, we can't possibly do that. Ben. It, it, it seems to me that... As the draft bill is at the moment, there is less freedom uh, for scientific innovation and new ideas than you would get in a university department, and there is more uh, control. There is no overall mission statement. One of the strengths of uh, ARPA, DARPA, when the, it was set up, was that the, there was an overall mission statement, which was to make the United States of America uh, a safer place. Do you think it's a mistake not to have an overall mission statement? And just incidentally, in terms of the detailed objectives in sort of A, 26A, B and C in the bill, it says look at the economy, innovation, improving uh, quality of life, but there's nothing about defence there. Is that a mistake? Mm. So I think, uh, uh, as you say, if you, look, if, you look at the, if you look at the original mission statement for the old ARPA in, in 1958, it was um, to, to, to prevent strategic surprise in science and technology. Not the exact words, but something like to prevent strategic surprise if, uh, in science and technology for the United States. Um, my, my version of it for here would be, as I said, to, to, um, to accelerate scientific discovery far beyond what's currently normal and to seek strategic advantage in some fields of science and technology for the United Kingdom. That's how I would define it. And I would keep it broad and vague like that. Um, I would also point out that if you talk to the old timers who are actually involved with ARPA and saw the transition to DARPA in 1975, they think that that was a retrograde, retrograde step. And in fact, DARPA after 75 had to come up with all kinds of bureaucratic wheezes in order to try and fund things like the internet in, in, in the future. So I wouldn't give it a specific defense focus. I certainly wouldn't try and import a bunch of buzzwords like AI and quantum and net zero and things like that. I just think it, it, it doesn't add anything. I would stick to, um, stick to a broad mission statement as I've, as I've described, sampling this broader design space for science and technology and achieving strategic advantage for Britain in, in some fields. That's how I would limit, that's how I would define it. Uh, but my final question, I don't know if you're uh, familiar with the Howard Hughes Research uh, Center just outside Washington, DC, mm -hmm. which has some of the best uh, scientists in the world looking at, at, at the brain and how it functions, trying to make breakthroughs. It seems to me, and I, I'd be interested in your comments, that you are uh, promoting something more like that Howard Hughes Centre on, on, on the brain, rather than uh, a, a, a UK DARPA. So uh, yes, I am. I am familiar with uh, with that. I actually visited the Janelia Farm, uh, where, where, where that institution is, and actually, I brought over a brilliant young British neuroscientist uh, who was working there, uh, and he now works in Number Ten, and he made some um, critical contributions to how we, uh, how the British government dealt with um, COVID last year. Um, I, 
I, I don't think that what, what I'm proposing is not to have something which is very which is narrowly focused like that on one area. So I wouldn't just say aim at neuroscience or whatever. I would leave I would leave that those sort of decisions to the the, the institution. I would to, to argue itself. I would leave it as a very broad science and technology thing. Not least because to begin with, the the people that are, that are running it. Um, one of the crucial lessons for ARPA in the 60s and 70s was giving people space for problem finding, not just sending them off saying solve this problem straight away. Problem finding is, is as important, sometimes more important than, than, than solving the problem. So I think when, you, when we create this thing, the people who are running it need space and time to go out and talk to people out on the ground and figure out what are these uh, ideas. So by definition, um, things like creating the internet in the 60s are not obvious. They're not on the front pages of the newspapers. They're not all being talked about in, in, in scientific conferences now. They're not on the front page of science and nature by definition. So it'll take time to go and find these ideas and find these uh, often very odd people who are, who, who, who are pursuing them. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, we'll go to <coughs> Catherine Fletcher now. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, um, Dominic, for offering to come and talk to us today. Um, what you're describing is almost like a skunk works model, if I put it in my language, which is a bunch of incredibly bright people kind of working in the same space and feeding off each other. Um, what do you actually want them to do? You keep saying go and sample, but are we sampling in highly theoretical aspects like, I know, I don't know, aligning quantum mechanics and special relativity? Are you are you sampling in achieving long-term goals like carbon attenuation or are you just boiling the ocean with 800 million quid and hoping for the best so i think i think it does definitely have some similarities with with, with the the famous skunk works uh in, in terms of the kind of the culture of the organization um looking for very extreme talent and having a very extreme antipathy for bureaucracy uh, are obviously two of the two of the key elements of, uh, of, of skunk works. But I think it's not, I, I've sort of deliberately avoided giving my, you know, views from, I don't think views from me on what sort of thing it should be looking at are, are, are honestly have, have any real value. Um, uh, it should be going off to people really out on the far edges of of, of the uh, of, of the science world and talking to them about what's uh, uh, about what's um, really what's really valuable. You know, if you look back at what happened in the early 60s, it was um, this guy Licklider who said, "Actually, computing could be done completely differently. I've got a vision for how we can have personal, interactive, dynamic computing with everyone universally networked." Worldwide, and he wrote a famous me memo about the intergalactic um, communications network. Now, those things are—they're not—they're they're hidden. You know, they're not. Uh, it's not for me to come out and, and start giving my, my my theories about uh, about what they should be. You need to find you need to find people who can go off and talk to these people out there, and in particular, searching for young people who now struggle yeah, to get funding. Well, yes, yeah, so I was going to come on to that. So um, I, we, I've been really personally struck by the amount of young, bright researchers that are frustrated with the bureaucracy, yeah. you know, not least women who can't plan a family because their funding settlements only run for the next 12 months. But yeah. what I'm bothered about is the fallibility of human beings in this system. So. If you've got like a tiny leadership team of a director and four trustees, you're effectively looking for like five Sir Patrick Valances or uh, Hooks or Boyles or Newtons. You know, the how are you going to stop a small number of people getting the wool pulled over their eyes by the tinfoil hat brigade that come along and say, if you give me 100 million quid, I'm going to, you know, stop aliens from being able to read our minds. How do you have in the leadership the technical understanding to not get the money spent badly? Well, so on, on, on your first point, I think the, the youth thing is a, is, is, is a, is a critical problem. Uh, and I'll give you a concrete example of that. One of the most influential physicists in Britain in the last 50 years is David Deutsch at Oxford, who wrote um, the famous papers around 1980, 1981 about quantum computers, which helped start the whole field going. If you ask him, he recently went back to the people who actually funded him and said, you know, what would happen if I came to you with my 1980 idea now? And they all said, well, there's obviously no way on earth you'd ever get funded now. 
So I think yeah, that sums agreed. up the problem you're talking about, that it's very hard now for young people to get funding for ideas which are far from the normal. You know, now everyone babbles on about quantum computers and it's become a buzzword. No, no, yeah, that's cool. But, but it's, how we do need... you stop the tinfoil hat brigade pulling the wool over five people's eyes with a lot of money? Well, you, you've, got to, you've got to pick the five people very carefully. But then those five... So the ARPA model is that you have a very, very flat organisational structure. You have a director in charge of it. And then they have good taste in finding people. And there's no, there's no alternative to this fundamental problem. You have to have someone in charge who has good taste in scientific uh, ideas and in scientific researchers. That's how all of these institutions work. It's how General Groves operated the Manhattan Project. It's how Rowena found Lick Lider in the first place. It's how uh, Lick Lider found Robert Taylor. It's how Robert Taylor created Xerox Park in the, in the 1970s. There is no alternative ever discovered on Earth to having funders with great taste in ideas and people. I, I, only, I gently point out that all the people that you've just mentioned are blokes and taste is one of those subjective human things that we need to be careful and worry about when concentrating great power in a small number of hands. But let me shift on to some of the evidence that we've heard uh, from people previously. It was all about culture and leadership and creating um, brains sparking off each other in interdisciplinary areas rather than giving an individual maverick the funding to go and you know produce that to what extent in your view of aria is that it, it, where's that collaboration and where's that mm. temporary nature yeah. that i thought was very powerful evidence so i think i think that i think this is a very important point um so i'll give I'll, 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 academia and universities now one of the things that they're terrible at and one of the things that the current system is terrible at is funding teams to do certain things the system now is extremely focused on individual researchers writing papers. It's terrible at funding teams where the output is not a paper. It's software or it's a tool or something like that. So, for example, uh, um, one example which, which, which everyone in this committee will be familiar, f familiar with is DeepMind. Demis Asabis had to go to California and, and talk to people like Peter Thiel to get cash to get DeepMind going because the British funding system just does not think naturally in, 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 in that way. And that's exactly one of the things I think that ARIA should be, should, should be able to do. It should be able to say, ah, okay, here is a Licklider type person. They've got a vision of how they can build this thing over the next 10 years. They need 50 million quid a year for say 10 years. Right, there you go, knock yourselves out. That's exactly the sort of thing that it should be doing. But I don't think it should be limited to that. So I think a crucial distinction is that often is lost in this ARPA-DARPA thing is now DARPA is very much focused on what's referred to as missions and moonshots and things like that where you have a specific goal and a specific deadline. So the 1960s Apollo, put a man on the moon by the end of a decade. That's a great model and that can bring fantastic uh, um, progress for civilization. But it's not the only way of doing things, and ARIA should not be limited to that. And I would point out that the Licklider vision for personal computing and interactive computing in the internet was not such a moonshot. It was a much more kind of ephemeral thing, and much more powerful for, for it being that. It actually drove decades of, of, of research and, uh, and, and discovery, and was so rich that you still have people now 50 years later in Silicon Valley, people like Brett Victor setting up new labs saying people have missed this idea from 50 years ago. So I think oh, ARIA, honestly, Aria I, should I, have I, that kind of freedom to do, both, to do both things. It should be able to find the Licklighters, but it should also be able to fund specific moonshots if it wants to. I, I'm, I'm with you. I mean, you know, I could spend ages debating scientific nerdery with you. I'm very conscious that we've got a public audience okay. who are be funding this ultimately. So final question, Chair. Uh, we'll ultimately, come back, uh, Catherine, if we may. We need to go to, to Dawn, but we'll, uh, I'll bring you in a bit later. Um, Dawn? Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you, Dominic, for coming to the committee. Pleasure. And Dominic, you spoke earlier about um, finding scientists from America, bringing them over to work in number 10. I know you would have thought about this quite intently. Who do you think should be in charge of and who do you think should lead ARIA and why? Uh, 
So I think that the, the, the sort of person, um, I'll give you three, I'll give you th three people just to, as the sort of people who, who I, um, I, I would think of. Um, there's a guy called Michael Nielsen. Uh, he wrote the, the textbook on quantum computers. It's, I think it's one of the top ten cited physics books ever or something. Um, but he's also spent the last ten years really thinking, living in San Francisco, really thinking about how science itself.